Well, first of all, I'm retiring. That one is the fact. I need to retire in order to fight new battles. Now, I don't want to retire without showing you your brother, African peoples, who supported you. Welcome back to Wanapedia, your one-stop center for the history of Uganda. We are still at the event at which Ara 001 Yoe Kabuta Museveni formerly retired from the army he had founded in 1981. At this point is when uh, the, when the Minister of Defense, Amama Mbagazi, invited the president to speak. And then the president explains that this was not about decorating him, but that he was trying to use that opportunity to show the rest of Uganda, the people who had stood with Uganda when it was in its hour of need. He also took opportunity to give a long lecture on the history of the army, which all students of the military and those interested in the affairs of this world should pay attention to. Only on Wanapedia, to which you are in danger if you have not yet subscribed. Let's go back to Bongo Army Headquarters to witness this great speech, which began with General Tumine's famous song, which the president called for, Chino Chechise. Mr. President, it's now my singular honor and pleasure to request you to address the gathering as well as present gifts and medals. Before I make my speech, I want the band to first play Chino Kekisela Mwetruwanja Tuona Magombe. Thank you very much. Uh, Excellency, Vice President of Uganda, the Right Honorable Speaker of Parliament, the Chief Justice, the Vice Chairman of the National Resistance Movement, our brother delegations from the three countries in Africa and in, in the whole world that stood with us in our hour of need. <laughs> These days I say, I say a lot of advisors and authorities 
Kampala is full of advisors and authorities and ngamanyas, the ones who know everything. When we needed salvation, nobody in Africa or in the world stood with us, except these three countries at different times. I had many of the speakers and, uh, and the, the bishops were praying, saying that this is a, a ceremony to promote Museveni. That's not my idea. In my tribe, they say, when somebody invites you for a meal, it is because he wants you to give him a meal in return. I think the generals, uh, they want me to get out of the way so that they can get their own promotion. That's why they... <laughs> because up to now, our army is a big army by African standards. But the ranks are normally not e equal to, to the responsibilities. And this was deliberate. We wanted them to concentrate on learning rather than ranks and ranks and ranks. In fact, we get into some embarrassment because like the, our neighboring, our brother countries, you will not get a chief of defense forces who is a, a major general or even a lieutenant general, they are, they are always full generals. But for us, we deliberately kept everybody down so that they concentrate on the work and not the uh, decorations. So the idea is not this promotion of Museveni. The idea today, there are two ideas. One idea is well, first of all, I'm retiring. That one is a fact. I need to retire in order to fight new battles. The, but the second and the most important is for me before I retire. That's why I invited delegations from these three countries. Because I have been there all the time. From A to Z, there is no aspect of this struggle that I don't know. Now, I don't want to retire without showing you your brother, African peoples who supported you. That's why this is the main, the main, the, the most important uh, aspect for today. Otherwise, if it is promotion and all this, why invite all these people? It could be done just uh, within uh, ourselves. So the most important thing is I want you, before I retire, because there are so many authorities now. So many authorities on Africa. But in my tribe, they say, Kurokura, ake kurokakuma nyakakafwa. It would be good that when you become a very important person, all the old women who knew you when you were young died so that they don't talk about your terrible things you are doing when you are young. The problem is that there is an old woman here called Museveni who knows everything about all these fellows who are running around. The foreigners, the what? So this is one aspect. I wanted to show you, you the young soldiers, all these big men, the vice presidents and all these big people, and um, MPs, honorable MPs, I wanted to show you people who stood by you. Because when you, I don't hear you, I don't hear you talking about them. 
You are talking about America, about uh, Britain, about European Union. There was no union with us. Maybe there is a European Union, but that union was not with Africa. So that's why I called these people here. The, my brother Ben Mkapa would have come, but he's sick. He has got a health problem. His leg is disturbing him. And because it was, a, it was a, when the, the generals were talking about promotion, for me, I was busy dealing with some terrorists. So I did not concentrate on, on, the, on the issue. Uh, until about two, uh, about two weeks ago, when I, I thought that maybe we must invite our brothers to come here. So that's when I spoke to uh, Ben Mukapa. He, he wanted to come, but he, was, he had a, a problem of his leg, which has been disturbing him. President Shishano already had a commitment in China. He, he was going to pay a visit to China. So that is the, or the second one, second point, other than the retirement. The song which I asked the band to play is a Luganda song, which was composed by the peasants in the struggle. I hear the young people singing Mozart, and I don't know who. But here, in Rueru, we had our own composers. That song is a Luganda song. It says, Chino Chirikisera, Mwetruanira, Mbisera Vyum Maso, Tuonama Gombe. This is the time we must fight so that we save ourselves from dying. From dying. That's what that song is saying. And that, and that is the main theme of the resistance movement. The people of Uganda are an ancient people that have been living under organized and centralized governments for millennia. At the time, the first Arab man to come here, a man called Ahmed bin Ibrahim, who came here in 1844. Our people were organized under four kingdoms. The kingdom of Buganda, kingdom of Bunyoro, kingdom of Tora, and kingdom of Nkore, and many chiefdoms like the ones of Busoga, Acholi, Lango, Mporo, etc. Many of these chiefdoms, like the ones of Busoga, had by this time linkages with Buganda. The chiefdoms of Acholi and Lango had linkages with Bunyoro, and the chiefdoms of Mporo had linkages with Nkore. Even the brother peoples, that were put by colonial boundaries in other sister African states, such as those of Karagwe, Buhaya area in Tanz of Tanzania now, Bunya, Butembo areas in Congo, were either part of these four kingdoms or were allies or had some linkage with the other four kingdoms. In any case, the peoples of these areas, the Great Lakes area, either speak dialects that are close to each other or have got historical linkages, such as the linkages of the, peoples of, Bunyo, of the people of Bunyoro and the people of Lango and Achori, the difference of language notwithstanding. In fact, these languages got mixed by borrowing words from each other. In Luganda, Lunyankore Rusoga, Ruhaya, Ruhaya, this is a, a dialect which is spoken in, in, uh, in the Bukoba area of Tanzania. 
and Runyambo. This is also another, di another dialect in Tanzania. The verb for help, the verb for help, Saidia, in Swahili. The verb these people use is Kuyamba. When I, when I want help from you, I say Obuyambi. Nyamba, help me. However, the Runyoro Toro, a dialect spoken in Bunyoro, Toro, and Bunya in, in Congo, in DRC, a dialect that is otherwise very close to Luganda, Runyankore, ETC. The verb for help is Kukonyera, quite different. You will hear a Muganda saying Kuyamba, to help, Kuyamba. Munyankore, Kuyamba. Musoga, Kuyamba. These Bahaya Banyambo people there, Kuyamba, meaning to help. But a Munyoro Mutoro would say Kukonyera, different verb. Now, these universities, they are learning about Chosa, Chosa, there is a, an English man who wrote a dead language called Chosa. But they, they don't know Kukonyera, what it means. You ask them. They will not inter interpret it for you. Now, this verb Kukonyera, which the Batoro, Banyoro use, this is directly derived from the law of verb for help. Coin, coin. Coin means help. <laughs> the Banyoro, Batoro, on account of close historical linkages with their choices and languages, bantunized, bantunized the law of verb coin into Kukonyera. Rather than using the other verb, kuyamba, that is commonly used by other Bantu peoples of this area. One of the Kamaka's entrances is called Wankach. My Baganda traditionalists here would know what Wankach means. This is definitely a law noun that means the main gate, gateway to a compound, otherwise called a rainbow by some of the other Bantu peoples. Therefore, what is now known as Uganda, as well as the neighboring countries of Kenya, Tanzania, Congo, Rwanda, and Sudan, yeah. have been populated for centuries or even millennia by either people with similar or close dialects and culture or a linked and shared history. In terms of military organization, these peoples had evolved quite advanced levels and methods. They were using spears, arrows, swords, guns, quivers, had armories in each homestead known as Ngango in one of the dialects. In the case of Uganda, 
It was the short-sighted rivalry of the kings that enabled the British to conquer Uganda. Had the kings united, in time, British colonialism would have been defeated at the very onset. Captain Lugard also noted as follows. Although the rain is good luck, but it has somehow sabotaged me. Because I wanted you to hear these words very carefully. Captain Lugard also noted as follows in quotes. In some respects, the Rinderpest has favored our enterprise. Powerful and warlike tribes are, their pride has been humbled and our progress facilitated by this awful visitation. The advent of the white man elsewhere had not been so peaceful. In other words, the imported afflictions to our people, such as smallpox, rinderpest, and jiggers, so weakened the people that colonialism was that much easier. Anyway, the British manipulated our leaders and used them to colonize Uganda. A British Army officer, Lieutenant Colonel Bartley, in his book, The King's African Rifles, has written as follows. In quotes, a threatening situation was developing in Bunyoro for Kabarega had taken, had taken the evacuation of the southern forts as a sign of weakness. He was rumored to have an army of 8,000 men equipped with fire, firearms and 20,000 spearmen, end of quote. Battle at further rights, in quotes, on 13th December, 1893, the expedition, that is the British colonial expedition, left Kampara with seven Europeans, 221 Sudanese, 156 armed and about 200 unarmed porters, a Maxim machine gun, and a steel boat in sections. At Mukwenda, at Mukwenda's, this was Mitiana now. At Mukwenda's place, Owen joined the column with another 200 Sudanese from the fort. The force was accompanied, was accompanied by 15,000 Baganda levies most the spearmen. So here you have a situation where seven Europeans are controlling almost 20,000 Africans from Buganda and some Sudanese mercenaries, and they are going to fight Kabarega in Bunyoro. That's how the British used the stupidity of the Africans to control them. He goes on to say, in quotes, on 25th February, two and a half companies from Hoima joined forces at Kungulu 
with two companies of, of Sudanese and 2,000 Baganda levies from Kampala for a combined attack on Kabarega's position across the Nile. By this time, Kabarega had crossed the Nile and gone into Lango. This was after about three, four years of war with the British. Because Kabarega fought the British for nine years here. When the troops approached the opposite bank, they found that the Nile was 1,100 yards wide, including the thick fringe of the papyrus. On 2nd March, the crossing was attempted in a fleet of native canoes covered from the bank by a Maxim gun. But so heavy was the fire from Kabarega's riflemen that the operation had to be abandoned. Captains Cunningham and Dunning of the Royal Fusiliers, these are British uh, uh, regiments, were wounded and the latter died on the way back to Hoima, end of quote. The colonization of Africa was therefore first and foremost the mistake of the African chiefs. Even today, the African leaders bear the primary responsibility for the misfortunes that afflict Africa. Although many of these afflictions are instigated from outside, the African leaders have the means to reject and terminate them. The main means available to us are our 800 million people, Africans, and our great landmass. Nobody could subdue or marginalize such a great force if we harmonized our efforts. What is even more disappointing is the fact that the British did not make honest efforts in the majority of cases to develop Uganda or its institutions. Other than Governor Andrew Cohen, who created the UDC, the Uganda Development Corporation, and built the Litro hydropower station at Jinja. No other serious effort was done by the British to transform their new possession, their new colony, Uganda. In spite of the fact that Ugandans were used to colonize their own country by mainly fighting the great resistance fighter Kabarego Bunyoro, in spite of the fact that they were used in the first imperialist war, the so-called World War, First World War, this was an imperialist war. What were they fighting for? To redivide the world. Germany wanted a share of the colonial possessions which the other imperialists had. That's what caused the First World War. And the Second World, Second World War, Our people were used in both those wars among Europeans and other imperialists, like the Japanese. In spite of our people being involved in these European wars, by 1958, there was not a single Ugandan, a single Ugandan commissioned officer in the King's African Rifles. Not a single one. We had been working for the British in the army from 1890 up to 1958. There was not a single commission officer, a Ugandan. All officers were British. It was only in 1958 that Shabano Polot was commissioned by the British, by the British Queen, as a second lieutenant. That was the first Ugandan to become officer after 70 years 
of working under the British Army. Soon after, Idi Amin was also commissioned the first officer cadet of Uganda, Karugaba, only qualified at Sandhurst in 1962. Is it not amazing that after the British using our people to fight their colonialist and imperialist wars for more than 70 years, had not found it necessary to develop at least a few of them for leadership? And when they did, the best they could get was Idi Amin. That's why I wanted you to hear my words. Lieutenant Colonel Bartlett writes as follows. This is in quotes. I am quoting British records. I'm not talking about my own things. In quotes, the final strength, therefore, wreaked by the KAR during this campaign, the campaign, this is the First World War, was seven regiments totaling 22 battalions. This is during the First World War, when the British were fighting the Germans in Tanganyika, what is now Tanzania, and also in Mozambique, because they even went up to Mozambique. 22 African battalions were mobilized to fight for these people. On page 414, Bartlett writes as follows, in quotes, the full casualty list for the campaign, ex exclusive of sickness and invaliding, totaled to nearly 18,000. 18,000 East Africans died fighting for the British in the First World War, so-called World War, but imperialist war. Casualties in respect of East African and Central African forces, no, 18,000 were all the casualties, all the casualties, because there were also Indian troops uh, here. 18,000 were all the casualties, casualties. Casualties in respect of Eastern, and, and Eastern African and Central African forces amounted to 294 officers, 136 NCOs, and 7,795 Africans, more than 45% of the total, who died in that, in that war, casualties in that war. This did not include careers. If you go to, 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 to Dar es Salaam, or even Nairobi, there's a place, there are places known as Karia Ko, Karia Ko. This was the Swahilianization of the English word carrier core, the, the ones who, who were carrying loads on their heads. So the, they call it in the Assam carrier core, and even in, in Nairobi. Carriers also were liable to battle casualties. And in addition, 40,000 of the 494,000 non-combatants enrolled for service during the warfare, the war, fell victims to disease. They had mobilized half a million almost Africans to, car to carry loads in addition to the, to the soldiers. This was in the First World War. In the Second World War, in the British war with the Japanese in Burma, which I am sure some of, of our elders like Mzee Musugri must have participated in. In the British war with the, with the Japanese in Burma, 50,000 East African troops were utilized in that theater alone. Bartlett writes of the unique qualities of the East African troops. This is in quotes. The monsoon was approaching its height when 11th East African Division entered the field. For two months, conditions were appalling. Yet the advance of 25 East African Brigade to Sitawung 
and the progress made by 26 East African Brigade down the Green Hill. Green Hill is in further courts now. Green Hill of the, of the Kaaba Valley proved to the 14th Army, 14th British Army, that monsoon operations could be carried out with success. So the East Africans have taught the British that you can operate during the rain. Well, you may clap, but we were not fighting our own wars, we were fighting other people's wars. The Japanese, taken by surprise at this unexpected thrust, following so closely the defeat of their offensive, were prevented from completing their preparations. End of quote. I'm going back to show you the history of this army here. Because you must know where you came from. So you know where you are and where you are going. That's why I wanted to speak without the rain, but the rain had its own reasons. The KAR was a colonial outfit completely divorced from the interests of the people of Uganda. The senior African leader, Marimu Nyerere, the late Marimu Nyerere, took the first opportunity to restructure the Tanganyika KAR, Tanganyika Rifle, they were calling it that time, in 1964, when they mutinied. When the Tanzanian KAR mutinied 1964 after independence, Marimu disbanded them. He incorporated some of them. That's how the Jerome Suguris remained there. But he disbanded it and built a new army. Here in Uganda, because you want to know the history of, of your country, the history of your army, here in Uganda, you are KAR, also mutinied at the same time. They mutinied, and instead of being punished, were pampered for mutiny. The product, they arrested the Minister of Defense, Felix Sonama, put him in the guard room, and because of that, they were given a salary increase by Obote. The product of all of this was monster Idi Amin. When you don't punish wrongdoing, you invite trouble. As a reward for arresting and confining to the guard room of Minister Onama, the Ugandan XKR soldiers were awarded salary increases. This was the beginning of Uganda's post-independence problems, emanating from the badly managed army. This colonial creature, without the brains of its former colonial masters and with the incapable political leadership, became a monster over the people of Uganda. Between them, the regimes of Obote and Amin killed a total of 800,000 Ugandans in extrajudicial killings. You will be able to visit one of the 30 mass graves in the Royal Triangle area. There are 70,000 scars that we were able to preserve in that area. These atrocities were not primarily a responsibility of the Ascaris involved, although they cannot be completely exonerated from these crimes. The main responsibility must be borne by the political leaders of Uganda that did not follow the example of Marimu Nyerere in using the political independence to create an army of a new type for the people of Uganda. I cannot blame the British or other coloni colonialists in Africa for not helping Africa to build a pro-people pro armies, because that had never been their mission in the first place. I, I can't quarrel with the British. Say, so why did you leave Idi Amin in charge of the army in Uganda? Because that's, that's not their work. They are colonialists. And they, they came to colonize. And if you are foolish, you are colonized. And it's up to you to clean up your own mess. Their mission had been colonialism and using just for their enterprise 
enterprise in quotes, as Captain Lugard wrote. It is, it is against this background that the people of Uganda eventually organized an armed people's protracted war against the remnants of the colonial state encapsulated in the form of the unrestructured KAR. If the KAR had been restructured, it could have been a good nucleus because the Askaris there were good soldiers. As you saw, they were fighting for, for the British in these wars. They could also have been restructured like Mwarimu did in, uh, in Tanzania. But here, they were not restructured. We took the opportunity of Amin seizing power from his uh, co-conspirator Milton Obote in 1971. We started mobilizing our people to transform political resistance into armed resistance. In this, we were assisted by three African brother peoples, the people of Tanzania, the people of Mozambique, and eventually the people of Libya. After pointing out a very, very historic fact that the British had no duty helping us to develop our own army properly here, the president then points out which of those countries really stood with Uganda and he names them as Tanzania, Mozambique and Libya. Indeed, as we will see later, the key players in that assistant later got decorated for their efforts. Only on Wanapedia, your one stop center for the history of this country and that of the rest of the world. Stay tuned for more.